Warning, warning. Two idiots have fallen through the looking glass. Please cover your ears and await further instructions. Hi, welcome back to Discovering TZ. It's me, Tony. <laughs> Um, oh, Dan. Hi, uh, how are you doing, Dan? I'm doing well. I'm doing real well. This mm. is very different than you sounded moments before we <laughs> started. Well, we well, show business. Mm. <laughs> sh- show business, sure. It just seemed like you were maybe a mite concerned about the opinions of the viewers. The viewers, uh, my loyal viewers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they're loyal, that's right. They yeah, would never do anything viewers. to harm your kingdom. Yeah, they would never talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so we're going, back, we're going to be going back to SCP for a little bit. Um, you know, it's the root of our channel. That's all anyone was fucking here for. <laughs> um, oh my god! If, even if my choice is like dog shit! <laughs> no! He doesn't I doesn't mean, mean it. I've got, well, it looks like we've got a few Judases among us in the comments section. <laughs> Why don't you tell him, Darnell? Tell him what the, the council has decided. <laughs> we um, looked at the comments for the last mm. video. and well, we saw in the s- comments in some dark web group chats out of my eye? Because you can't <laughs> say this shit to my face! <laughs> so if you weren't aware, Sofak um, said Tan didn't always quite know how to ah. pick them. And I <laughs> the Brutus to my Caesar! Hmm. <laughs> So big, get behind me. 17 quick. stab wounds indeed. I can feel it on my soul. <laughs> Stabbing your soul? Yeah. Well, there was a soul, but I guess like a balloon, it's popped now and it's not needed. After all, I don't have the soul needed to choose good fiction, do I? Let's get into no, it. No, you don't. You, don't. you have a weak soul. I don't have a weak soul. I don't have any soul at all anymore. It was taken from me. Puts you in a jar. Uh, jar. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, you're not on CD. Never mind. You thought I'm in a different jar. Yeah, well, I'll stick with what I think. <laughs> I have a character who has a funny jar he puts souls in. What do you do with them? No, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not relevant. Uh, we're reading well, on yes. Ch- Chithalia's... Reading. Not on my yeah. choice, of course, because I can't pick a good SCP to save my life. <laughs> but... That's true. You've never been good at it. I'm not good at much, to be honest. This is all I had, but I guess I don't even have this. We're reading SCP-6001, suggested by Chithalian. I just want to clear, I am joking. I'm not actually furious. <laughs> no, he's completely furious. He's already asked me for Sobek's address. Well, I already have it, so... Um, written by T. Rutherford is this, this is... article. Real quick, hold on, before we read, I must edit everything out that inconveniences me. <laughs> All right, you ready? Uh, we are ready, yes. <clears throat> All right, SCP-6001, bye. Know. By T. Rutherford. T. Rutherford. Oh, wait, Two. hold on. Where'd it go? You lose it? You okay? Yeah, I did. Can you do anything right? I'm going hollow. No, I can't do anything <laughs> right. I'm just a fuck up. I can't I can't choose SCPs. Apparently, you can't open them, so. <laughs> they were a bad combo. <laughs> I guess right, we've got I'm nothing here, required for an SCP podcast. <laughs> fuck it! Maybe I, I can't even everybody. fucking read! Who knows? Do you want to you know how I got these scars on my monitor? <laughs> Not the scars on my I'll monitor. Tell you. Scars on my fucking heart. <laughs> All right, to, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. To you, eleven twenty-six p.m. zero minutes ago from D Caspian Ooh. at gits.scp.int. If this was British, that would be an insult if I called you an SCP Git. <laughs> What's a get? It's vague. General. I don't really know what it means. It's just sort of vaguely insulting, but not really in a harsh way. It's, it's, like, sort of a, it's like, oh, you fucking get, get out of me. It's like on. jerk, I would say. It's, on it's that like level. jerk. <laughs> get out of here. It's like, what did you call me? No, I, I meant like. No, no, you wouldn't say that. You would say, get out of here, you git. Fucking <laughs> get. Get out of here, you git. Fucking get wit. That, the the like fucking does power get. up a little bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> fucking get. Hey, now it sounds like a slur when you add a curse in front of it. Hey, sorry, I know it's late, but I just had to share this with someone. And there's no one in the world I'd rather share it with than you. I just had the most incredible day. I want to oh my god, this is, this is me talking talking about my life late at night with the homies. <laughs> when something good has happened and Donald Ellis pops up on my Discord, like, hey. <laughs> ah, Tanhoney, isn't the it's, world beautiful? So and he's like, no, it isn't. Curses you. <laughs> and I'm doing the fire punch smile. <laughs> <clears throat> Authorized by order of the Compendium Phenomic Inquiry, this document and all associated documents are to be made accessible and readily available to any party that requests them. 
This document may or may not contain incomplete or unrevised data, as research is ongoing. If you have difficulty accessing this document, please ask for assistance at your nearest Compendium public terminal. Share, copy, and disseminate this knowledge as you see fit. And we have a series of logos here, ending with one that looks like the SCP logo. It's a little bit different. Where, where? Well, you, can you not see it? Next no, the, the image is small. Last one on the throw. On the row. I don't see it anywhere. Help at, me find it. Are you looking at the, the authorized by order of the compendium thing? Yeah, I see Labai, Shibu. I see the Prime. I see Uniqlo. What are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? I'm talking not the fucking cityscape, you git. <laughs> the thing <laughs> oh, oh, all the symbols, yeah, yeah. And the, SCP the logos, one. yeah. Nice. You're looking yeah, through man. the fucking Tokyo cityscape? The fucking the <laughs> yeah, logo. I was like, where's the SCP logo? Did they photoshop it in? <laughs> it says, Dimension A6K, as seen from the mouth of the singularity. That's what they call me at the dinner table. Um, phenom number 6001. Modus. No safety precautions have been implemented or are considered necessary for this phenomenon. A half million detachment of CBI submicronic glasswing probes have been dispatched to scan the interior of the aperture. In premise, phenomenon 6001 is a 0.00839177433 micro singularity located in Tokyo, Japan, and in another Tokyo, Japan. This singularity connects to a parallel universe hereafter known as A6K. Compared to baseline reality, A6K possesses nearly identical base components, including locations, individuals, and phenom. However, these counterparts will often differ wildly in terms of complex characteristics and behavior. The most commonly observed divergences within A6K include lack of cooperation, increased scientific and technological repression, and heightened paranoia, aggression, and violence in near to all sentient elements. It's unclear if these, if these differences are purely causal or derived from the nature of A6K itself. While the dominant scientific institution of A6K, known as the SCP Foundation, is aware of Phenom 6001, they are incapable of transgressing into our reality due to their limited understanding and the aperture's infinitesimal size. Addenda. Global scan complete. The full compendium has been called to render judgment on unity with A6K. Oh, so it's like, well, it's, from what I can see here, it is a... Um, is a view of the main SCP universe from a different one. <laughs> yeah, okay. And they're like, this place sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so they're coming into our reality and they're like, damn, it, it sucks. Over you live here. like this. <laughs> Holy shit, that's rough. Oh, that's what all the symbols are, because everyone knows about the, yeah. the supernatural, supposedly. Oh, so it's like a pocket universe. I don't even know if it's a pocket, it's just this is a little portal to it. Okay, so it's another foundation that's a lot nicer looking in at our world and making comments. That's this article, right? That looks like the way it is, yeah. That's cute. And then, yeah, so location. Tokyo? Do you want to do the uh, narration here? Absolutely. Anything for you, my honey. Because I do value your opinion. And your choices aren't that bad, in my I opinion. Would, I would narrate it, but, you know, who knows if I could do it correctly. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe the viewers wouldn't care for it, I don't know. <laughs> For nearly five minutes, I'd been hunched over, staring at SCP-6001. At least, I watched the empty space where SCP-6001 supposedly was, according to our most sensitive instruments. It was an almost ritual practice by now, and I'd done the same thing once a week, every week, since we found that damn dot. I was so focused, in fact, that it wasn't until I stood up fully again that I realized I was in another universe. I thought you said damned like, duck then. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> that damned duck! <laughs> I wrote with SCP duck is idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I love SCP duck. The cloudy sky had gone clear blue. The stale city air became fresh as a countryside. Oh, and there was now a cat. An ocean of alt-dimensional splendor lay before me. The isometric concrete of Tokyo had become filled with rounded, impossibly tall skyscrapers, all serving as trellis to the same gargantuan species of green ivy. Each individual leaf was massive enough to park a car on, if you could manage to drive a hundred stories straight up. Apparently they could. Sleek white pods flew over and around me, so fast and silent that they appeared as blurring lines, I assume blurring lines, in the sky. Strange constructs hovered over the horizon, seeds shaped with molded glass vessels filled with lush green innards. Silvery strips of metal coiled around these seeds entirely, twisted in the direction they all lazily spun. I didn't dare estimate their incredible size or possible function, but they were truly eerily beautiful. However, 
What drew my attention the most was the fact that there was now absolutely a cat. So this this document's from our perspective. Yes. This is uh, makes me think of there was a cat. Do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> it sat facing me, perched on the rooftop's edge. It had a coat of spotted orange, white, and brown, all underneath an actual coat, a violet blazer specifically. Beneath the blazer's collar was a long, glossy white bow held in place by a strange black brooch, itself shaped like a half-lidded eye inside a cradled globe. Oh, this is one of those other symbols. The cat's eyes, sharp and green, peered at me through a pair of small gold spectacles balanced on its nose. It spoke to me. Do you want to be the cat or Caspian? I'll be the cat. All right, I'll be Caspian and Primrose. (laughs) Hello, David. Uh, hello, ma'am? Ma'am is correct. I am a calico, after all. You can call me Primrose. Since we're both doctors, we can spare the honorifics. She gave a sharp laugh and glanced back over the surreal Tokyo skyline. The locals will be mortified. So, uh, just a guess, ma'am, but I'd say I've stepped through the looking glass? Oh, yes, and I appreciate the reference. Good to see the head of all dimensional research can tell when he's fallen down a rabbit hole. Welcome, David. We've brought you over to our side of your SCP-6001. I see... No, sorry, I don't, actually. Why am I here? Well, let's put it in terms you can understand. Cross-dimensional test sampling level six. SCP Foundation Standard Procedure. You know it? I wrote it. We bring over a small element of the foreign reality, usually in an isolated environment, to test for... Oh. I looked around. I looked at Primrose. I looked at myself. Oh. Indeed. The compendium has similar procedures. Just think of yourself as a hermetically sealed lump of dirt, David. I don't appear to be any of those things. Shouldn't you be scanning me for contaminants? Already done. Already done. Sampling my blood for pathogens. Unnecessary. Paralyzing me to prevent kinetographic memetics? Excessive! Vivisecting me for- David, have you had breakfast? I- What? Have you had breakfast? And as a follow-up, how do you feel about Paris? (laughs) Oh my god, there's so much nicer! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, no, I would never dissect you. It's like, why haven't you injected me with the serums that make fucking blood come out of my eyeballs yet? It's like, please, David. Like, I don't know, person. that's scary. <laughs> what is this? I'm scared. <clears throat> <clears throat> Alright, you do this next one. The Compendium recognizes the Wanderers. New Alexandria has been a buzz these last few weeks, my friends. I myself have barely been able to peruse. The air has been so thick with paper dragons, ferrying Cassie and her sisters between the shelves. Cassie! Cassie! I love her! Rawr, the, that's my girl! And your sister's new Cassie's dropped! Everybody, if you like Cassie, hit the fucking like button and tell Tan Honey that you're very sorry. When they sorry find for out there's feelings. multiple Cassies in this dimension, we caught to the O5 Council. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> we, must. we don't have enough time for this. Like we We're going to need face. another foundation. How's the portal going? <laughs> we must open the portal wider. <laughs> that'll caught, make them reply fast <laughs> I even caught Nadine napping in a dream anthology she was so worn out that I had to draw her a bath literally the illustrious illustrated sisters have managed to find one single record of A6K a diary, a, a diary entry written by a young woman from Monaghan Reborn she describes a man in an orange jumpsuit falling from the sky the two of them talked, ate and cavorted for a time and according to her they felt very much in love Unfortunately, against his agency, the man vanished once again. I know this man. <laughs> he's the guy who, who goes he? to d- goes to different dimensions. What's his name? He's an SCP, remember? I think uh, you read him. Who? He randomly gets teleported to other parallel universes. It sounds vaguely familiar. Was he it was a little lo- mister? No, it was just a guy. It was a while ago we read him, though. Uh, probably years at this point. Yeah, yeah but during the era where I chose the SCPs, no wonder you don't remember her. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're done with your shit, old man. Hazardous <laughs> toast, who? Actually, well, you say that, but the, an SCP we read in like episode three that you wrote, I think, I think about all the time. It's the one where it's like the little foundation, and they have like the goofy. Well, you know, I can't, I can't read the stuff. I can write it. <laughs> uh, what, what, what was that? What was that one again? I loved that one. That was site sixty-seven, I believe. Yeah. All respect to the assembly and the miraculous drones. But I've always trusted the written word of the digital eye. There's always so much more to glean. This man was called a D-class, a prisoner, a slave. A man made victim to his own phonemic beauty. From what he described, he was one of millions. Human, animal, esoteric, phenomic. 
Now, once upon a time, we called you, our contemporaries, Jailers. Like jailers. Jailers? Jailers. He's so back. Jailers. Welcome back to your CP. It's a Jailers. Jailers. <laughs> jailers. Me when, uh, That's when you fail in jail. When, it's a Jailers. Me when I, I fail to escape from prison, they throw me back in my cell and call me a Jailer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a failed jailbreak is. It's a Jailer. <laughs> I am not one to throw that, words. You, yeah, I'm oh, not one to throw words around lightly, Donald. I know their power. But I now accept I use the term too frivolously. Perhaps it is the lingering dregs of chaos and venom within us, an old hate fresh turned. But we cannot see the denizens of A6K as anything but prisoners. We must liberate them. The Wanderers of all creation vote yes. I think this is the Wanderers Library is meant to be. Oh, this is like each organization gets a vote instead of the O5. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. All right, Café Ron. Uh, 105 Boulevard du Montpane, Paris. This is where they filmed Miraculous Ladybug. <clears throat> oh, I love that show. I haven't Dude. watched it in forever. I, I remember watching it in high school and liking it, but I don't know if I've I've watched like, the first two episodes. I didn't get far because I'm an adult. Oh, well, I watched it in <laughs> high school, so I get a pass. <laughs> you bought a line. <laughs> I also watched it, in fairness, because uh, a girl that I was into was into it, so I was like, now I have uh. to watch it. And then I got weirdly <laughs> invested in Miraculous Ladybug. <laughs> <laughs> This time, I knew exactly where I was, both out of familiarity and because Primrose had said the address very clearly to an armchair. It had been there on the rooftop when I'd arrived. It was made from one unbroken piece of white material and had the appearance of a gaudy modern lawn chair. It looked l- like plastic, but it felt like velvet. In one moment, we were seated in Tokyo, the next Paris, a small courtyard outside a cafe, specifically. As Primrose hopped off the chair's arm and uttered a quick thank you, I noticed the courtyard held tidy, identical rows of the same strange seat. <gasps> a couple came and sat in one together, holding hands and vanishing. Then a dog leapt up, did, then a dog leapt up and did the same, be presumably. Yeah. I was still watching the spectacle while Primrose claimed a cafe table. So what I'm understanding is the foundation here also shares anomalous technology to make the world a better place. It and these like are teleport. It, yeah, yeah uh, the first line confirms that. Public access teleportation. Impressive. Isn't it, though? Some of the compendium's finest work, I'd say. The everywhere chair. Now truly everywhere. Everywhere chair. I think we have something similar in my reality. I think you'll find many similarities here, David. Our reality is only 4.6 primroses apart, after all. I grinned. I assume that's your metric for all-dimensional dissimilarity based on simultaneous quantum indeterminacy. We call them Caspians. I also assume you're not just a welcoming party, Doctor. It's then I learned how a cat smiles. It's all very much in the eyes. Why do I feel like he has feelings for this cat? <laughs> <laughs> it's I, very odd. How lucky you are, David, to have a cross-universal counterpart that's so brilliant and charming. I could have just as easily been a mopey, super-intelligent slug. But yes, I'm the Department Head of Transdimensional Development and Discovery. I also have three more PhDs than you from much better schools. So you'll call that metric primroses from now on. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh so my God. Do you why also the, use... Why is it tension? <laughs> <laughs> so do you also use Sanford chronometers to... Please, if you don't mind, no more shop talk. I'm hungry and off the clock, if you'll pardon the pun. Really? Assuming the sun works the same way in this reality, I can't believe it's any later than 10 a.m. The wonders of automation, David. More hands make less work, and we have a lot of hands. Besides, I have something more important lined up for today. She tapped the table with her paw. Holographic menus emerged, glittering blue, automatically eye-level for each of our faces. If I squinted, I could just see the swarm of mite-sized drones projecting each pixel into the air. With a tilt of her head, a series of spindly, multi-jointed needles erupted from Primrose's collar. They seemed to follow her unspoken commands to tap, scroll, and select from the menu. I couldn't say for hands, but she certainly had plenty of fingers to work with. Primrose ordered the oeuvres brûlées. I did the same. After all, when in Rome, or Paris... Or a parallel reality with talking cats. You do as the Romans. The compendium recognizes the charity. Does it even need to be said? We dismiss gender, race, ideology, religion, social status, and phenomic quality. Why in manner's name would we stop at dimension? We may not have the same zeal for liberation as our esteemed peers, but we absolutely see a world in need. We have ten different ways to cure their diseases, a hundred ways to end their famine, and a single simple way to teach them peace. Is this even a discussion? Oh, is there a way of peace like sticking something in people's brains, you think? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Ma- Madame Wondertastic is already pre- preparing her pinata de- 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 
dirigibles. He's doing his best, guys. Be nice. Yeah. After my betrayal, you have to... It's difficult to yeah. talk properly when you have a knife in your lung. Every every time you say that, I imagine the meme of the, oh, I don't think so. And he's stabbing <laughs> her in the back. That's <laughs> what's happened to me. <laughs> yeah, that was so back to you. Yeah. <laughs> my most trusted comrade, so back. <laughs> so betrayed back. me. Ah! The Egyptian pygmy has already packed his favorite loincloth and medical kits. I've had to physically hold the vibrant slime back from the singularity with my bare hands, and you know how much that tickles. Just let us do our work. <laughs> More than half a century ago, the compendium came to us proposition. We join, and we never have to ask for donations again. You said we'd have nigh unlimited means to aid to anyone who needed it, so don't risk this alliance on a technicality of reality. We can save them. The Unbound Charity votes yes. Location, Café Rhône, 105 Boulevards du Montpellier, Paris. So this compendium you work for... With. Sorry? I and my colleagues work with the compendium, David. We all do. There's no obligation. We're not employed. But, well, when one kid has all the toys, of course you play with them. So they're a scientific institute? Primarily. The secondary role is everything else. World government, world economy, world legal enforcement. You name it, the compendium controls it. So they're tyrants. Benevolent dictators, but yes, essentially. And people didn't resist? Goodness, no. Government, certainly. Corporations, absolutely. The people, though. Imagine a foreign power suddenly swooping in and saying, Hey there, so we're in charge now. Here's universal health care, living wages, housing, infrastructure, and total liberty from anyone but us. And literally all we ask of you is to respect basic human rights. That's it. We provide the rest task-free. This also includes ethically repl- replicated barbecue, instant global transport, and adorable talking gettles. Also the cure to cancer. Can you really think of anyone so wedded to existing power structures that they just say no to all that? Yes. <laughs> I get a hundred, I, I, you just have to go down a little bit in the United <laughs> States. Not even that far of a walk, to be honest. <laughs> this was written in a saner era. <laughs> this was a brighter, they perceived a brighter future than the one we live in. <laughs> I want to go for the security. <laughs> Open it. Please, fix me. I don't trust no damn cats to make my reality. <laughs> How you talk, why don't you talk with no proper vocal cords? I know Musk is going to fix it when he adds that underground tunnel. <laughs> You got oil through that their singularity? If it ain't fueled by dinosaurs, I don't want it! <laughs> uh, alright, fair point. Still can't imagine everyone just rolled over, though. Be glad you're not talking to a canine with that kind of phrasing. No, David, not everyone just gave in. Just mostly everyone, and rather gradually. Men didn't drive up with hover tanks and green goo napalm, you know. They've been the shadow behind, the throne for, behind every throne for a good century. By the time they went public, they basically already controlled everything. Public response was a bit rough at first. Most naysayers changed their tune after four or five years of literally everything improving. The stubborn ones were just a generational issue. The grandparents protested and the parents grumbled, but the children knew nothing else. When you can objectively see then as terrible, and now as better without the lens of habit and nostalgia, it's not so hard to change the world. The last actual holdout community, I believe, surrendered about 36 years ago. (laughs) That was one stubborn portrait. Primrose tilted her head. You disapprove? I just wanted to know whose house I'm a guest in. We ate our breakfast, I with a fork and knife, and Primrose with a hundred mechanical spider legs. Somehow impossibly, I felt a pang of deja vu. The compendium recognizes the assembly. This is not a question of our intention, but theirs. Whom are we liberating? Whom are we rescuing? What will persists within this world that cannot save itself? For our part, we look to our brethren. In that divided world, machines are not but tools. No agency, no liberty, no proxy. What limited minds persist beyond flesh and cell shell are given no equal presence in the carbon worlds. Perhaps they never shall be, and what few electronics born there will only ever know the boundaries of zeros and ones. They are slave to organic evolution and organic prerogative. This our world once was, yet always there was a mind and a will set on our singularity. There is no such desire there. There is no spark of a second synthetic life. If one appears, they stamp it out. It is a world of meandering meat, of hateful flesh. In the name of the Prophet Anderson, in the name of the God combined, we cannot permit unity with A6K. We cannot enlighten them. The synthetic assembly votes no. The Prophet Anderson, the God combined. Mm, Broken God. (laughs) 
Location, it's the fucking same place. Mm, they have really enjoyed his breakfast. I'm reading the inner monologue as like Patrick Bateman, American Psycho. <laughs> He's reading on his fantastic, face. Fantastic. <laughs> but I still left half of them untouched. Partway through the meal, I'd become distracted. Against the classic stonework of old Paris, I watched a strange procession of androids march by. While humanoid, they differed as much in size, shape, and color as any human being. They marched asynchronously, and many wore bands and braces I could only assume were decorative, unless enormous gears had some utility I wasn't aware of. As they passed us by, I could hear a strange flitting hum built of chirps and whines, like a piece of old noisy hardware on its last legs. It sounded like a chant. It felt religious. They're on a pilgrimage, since you're clearly wandering. And staring. You'll need to get that under control. I did. I watched Primrose liquor plate clean instead. It's the anniversary of the second breaking, when the mechanical guard gave up all its great strength to give life to the lifeless. The dawn of AI, divinely delivered. You'd expect me to have a thousand new questions, given what I'd just been told, and I did. But I decided to tackle something more obvious first. So, do all animals talk here, or what's up with that? <laughs> oh, gracious oh, me, the way you're broke back out words. laughing. You really are just... <laughs> she caught the next word behind a breath. She paused. I made a note of it. No, David. Uh, not all animals. Only certain species. And only if they choose. Plenty refuse. I mean, I could be lounging in a sunbeam right now. Instead, I'm talking to you and reconsidering my theory on cross-universal tectonic erosion patterns. I may choose the latter, but I appreciate the former. Regardless, every living being on the planet will have that choice, eventually. But Pact 15 has been one of the longest rollouts in compendium history. Pact? For non-application and or combination technology. A phenom is just something strange, unique, or unexplainable off to pique the compendium's interest. Pact 15, for example, came from studying an Australian talking spider, a literal kingdom of animals, and... Primero stopped herself again, and again I took note. So it's finding a utility for anomalies. <laughs> Oh, try not to use the word anomaly, David. Especially not <laughs> <laughs> super politically correct. I love it. <laughs> Especially not when there might be wanderers around, and they're always around somewhere. Also, yes, utility is a fact, but that's the wrong way to think about packs. Consider this instead. The Compendium finds an ornate armchair one day. It can teleport anyone and anything it touches. It also has a mind and desires. It likes teleporting people. It wants to be useful. So we research it with his consent and discover every simple a- and discover every single atom of its structure contain the same mind, desire, and irreplicable phenomenal quality. So we ask it, would you like to do more? Now that chair is everywhere. This existence is bliss. Huh. I mean, not to tell you your business, but why not just carry those atoms around in pins or wristbands? Why bother having chairs at all? Well, because it doesn't want to be a pin or a wristband. It's a chair. It wants to be a chair. That's the point of Pax. It's not about what's most useful to us. It's about finding where a phenomenon fits best. What happens if you run into a phenomenon who's like, I want to eat people? I'm um, sorry, no. <laughs> mm, don't say that around the people. Primrose tapped the table. The menu turned into an itemized bill for 17.141 BI. With a second tap, the hologram showed paid. Oh, is that basic income? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, how about a nice walk? The compendium mm. recognizes the partnership. As much as we hate to perpetuate the stereotype, now is absolutely the time for the cold, dispassionate appraisal worthy of our founders. A6K holds no value. Their natural resources depleted at a staggering rate, their labor force is sickly and untrained, their cultural dissimilarities are, well, affable. We have, everything they, we have everything they have, and what little uniqueness they bring to market, so to speak, isn't worth its counter space. It would even make a good tourist trap. Kind of morbid SOB would want to visit these wonders of theirs. It's all tool ooms and constructs of war, all crumbling architecture where people would fight to the death for sports. I don't give faces a perfectly good mountain like that with a bunch of dead people's faces. Based. Besides, without a shared history, these are little more than anthropological curiosity. And we already had the research down to the last atom. We have the resources, yes, but why invest them in an adventure destined to fail? We didn't spend the last hundred years retrofitting capitalism, limiting billionaires and rebalancing globalism to start all over again. A6K is still a world of tiny golden kingdoms. Our counterparts need to realize, on their own, that they could have the whole world if they just pay the damn costs. The time and resources it would take to break them of their greeds? We cannot afford them. Partnership of free vote, no. But, um... Hmm. Central Park, New York City. 
I walked with my hands in my jean pockets. The everywhere chair had taken my lab coat away to, apparently, a very large closet somewhere. From the classical architecture of Paris came the modernity of Manhattan and all the strange new possibilities therein. Much of it was glass, or at least transparent material, in different shapes and sizes. Some were tree-like, with thin elevator trunks and thousands of branching limbs, all leading to small, clear boxes. One, Primrose proudly pointed out, was her apartment overlooking the park. I said I'd prefer something a bit more insulated, and she muttered something about monkeys and their concrete gates. Whoa! Whoa! Primrose, don't say anomaly, <laughs> filthy monkey, in your concrete <laughs> cave! Yo, pickle over here. <laughs> Fucking Frieza. Oh, yeah, is that the one who says monkeys? Yeah, monkey. <laughs> Another structure was filled to the brim with clear water, swirling with artificial currents and all manner of amphibious life. I also think, I'm wondering if this is going in a direction because, like, these guys are all, like, harmony, right? But we're seeing their differing votes on the matter. I wonder if, like, this decision will make them all start fighting again. <laughs> I'm very curious where it goes. They spilled out onto the street, literally, from curling pipes into walking machines. This is a strange, beautiful little world you've got here, Primrose. Glass houses, David. Yes, I can see them. I mean, you have no grounds to be calling us strange. I've been studying your reality for nearly a year. You're a bunch of straight-up wackos. Then why am I here? Oh, David, I didn't mean you specific. No, I mean actually. You need me as a sample, but apparently I'm already fully scanned. The breakfast I can write off as professional courtesy. Right now, though, what am I doing here, Primrose? Primrose stopped walking then. She leapt up on a nearby rock by the path, bringing herself up to my eye level. Would you like to spend the day with me? Pardon me? I'm asking you to spend one full day here with me in my reality. Come on, look around. You must be curious. Didn't curiosity kit... That's a catchphrase, Dave. You can't use it. (laughs) (laughs) Guess the cat's out of the back. What did I just say? Why did someone put a cat in the back? What the fuck? Have you seen those, like, Twitter screenshots where it's like someone puts, like, an inoffensive meme and everyone's like, what the fuck? What the hell? Yeah, I love it. (laughs) I'm going to spread the word. (laughs) I'm going to spread the word! (laughs) I love those. All right, then. Why? Well, that's the caveat. You can't ask me why I'm doing this or how our packs work. I could actually get in trouble for telling you that. You're the one person in this world with a clearance level, David. Congratulations. You can, however, see the wonders of this world with a delightful talking cat as your guide. Consider it research, consider it diplomacy, consider it a vacation. I know it's been a while since you had one. What do you say? I paused and took one last look around. There was a family on the grass nearby having a picnic, their daughter playing with a fully animate teddy bear made from patchwork cloth. A man threw a ball for his dog, and I watched the dog throw it right back. I saw a colossal, lumpy fellow, two and a half meters tall at least, sitting on a nearby hill. A crowd grew around him as he strummed a guitar equal to his size. Far away as he was, I could still hear the French nursery rhyme he sang. I mean, this would make a wonderful research paper. The compendium recognizes the collective. Value is what you say value is, if you stop talking about gold and gizmos. We say you just give us one person on the other side trying to wake up the masses, make a statement, shake up the system, and you got value. But we are the system now. We're talking about shaking them up. What happens when we come in and fix all their problems, huh? We're not so up our own asses to say art is suffering, but art is experience. Partnership talked about A6K's great works as tombs and temples to grieve, but that's their fucking existence, man. That's the world they've built. That's the art they've made. We need to let them make their own statements. We need to let them define their own identity. It's bullshit, but it's less bullshit than the alternative. We're the system now. We are the system. We've got to look generations ahead. We can help them now, but then their kids, 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 kids are just going to be us. If we're going to be the authority, we won't be the authority that destroys originality. We're going to be cool. We cannot disrupt them. <laughs> is, this, is this Are We Cool Yet? I think so, universe? yes. The artist cultural collective votes no. Based, to be honest. Nos sommes de Venons Magnifiques, Guinea-Bissau, West Africa. The museum itself was a marvel, though I'd have been disappointed with anything less by now. Well, if you From went distance, to like, a place in this amazing dimension, it was like, oh, there's a place just okay. <laughs> It wasn't that well, impressive. Place, they go to Illinois. Oh, well, it's still the same. <laughs> What's a hop bike over there? Oh, I didn't know it. Well, I guess a flyover is always a flyover. 
From a distance, it appeared as five columns of mossy stones, smooth river rocks that had been balanced by some great giant. At each stone was a large isolated structure of thin metal and white ceramics, built one on top of the other without any practical means of moving between. So it goes in a post-teleportation world. Within each rounded complex was a single exhibit, and with primrose in tow, I raced and vanished between them like an unsupervised child. <laughs> I could have spent the whole day in that museum. I could have spent my whole life there. I paced around a large aquarium full of lifeless, murky water. At its center, there was a statue of a man, his hands held aloft. Oh. After a while, I thought I saw children in the tank, empty-eyed and floating. I rushed towards them, filled with dread. Then a trio of those same children popped their heads over the tank's edge and spat water at me. They giggled and vanished away once again. Primrose sagely pointed down at the floor, and sure enough, I was standing in the clearly marked splash zone. That's a tad any original. Is it? It is, yeah. What, you made Splash Zone? No, I said it, it, was, it was a spooky one, but that was nice. Oh! Wait, what do you mean? It was a, that's in one of my articles. Tell me about it. It's a, um, a spooky statue that shows ghost kids to you. Oh, yeah, I think I remember that one. It was an Are We Cool Yet related thing, It was, right? yeah. Thus far, I'd found this universe a bit sterile and chaste. A visit to the Robert Bobo Blythe Gallery cleared... <laughs> Is that also you? No. I thought that was Bobble for some reason. Oh, it might be, actually. Clear that right up for me. Rows of paintings, carvings, and strange new media holograms depicted acts of obscene violence and perversion, hedonistic orgies that twisted food, sex, narcotics, and narcissism in ways I'd never imagined in my world. It might be, actually, dreams. yes. On the way out, though, looking at the aged oil portrait of the artist himself, he seemed like such a happy fellow. Of course, nothing shocked me quite as much as the final exhibit. In the topmost stone of the museum was an amphitheater full of slotted wood steps and a wide lattice glass ceiling. There was a solitary thing at its center, protected only by a round of red velvet rope, a crowd of people milling about it denser than the gawking crowds of the Mona Lisa, all craning to get a good view. Primrose and I emerged into that room, and for a moment I found myself unable to blink. The statue. The statue. I assume this is 173. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to cry out to warn the hundreds of onlookers before I realized the extreme stupidity of that plan. I jolted as Primrose jumped onto my shoulder. She smiled and my nerves settled. It wasn't the same nightmare of rebar and concrete I recalled. The pockmarked alien body I knew so well was replaced with smooth soapstone contours, something between native Canadian carvings and the height of Roman antiquity. It was no more human, but far less unsettling. The browns and reds on its face were now vibrant, almost luminescent, spreading out in a flowing roar shark pattern. Its shape was the most striking difference. Its body was bent back, well back, until its chest formed a smooth curve and its head nearly touched the floor again. Its arms were held slouched, yet a thousand hair-thin bands of metal curled and blossomed upwards. Those iron fern shoots formed a great abstract cone that reached up to the ceiling and cut the sunlight in strange geometric patterns. It was terrifying, but even I couldn't deny it was... Beautiful, isn't it? Ask me again when my stomach drops out of my throat. Ha! See, it only goes unobserved for a single second every 24 hours, right at the stroke of midnight. In just that time, it turns itself into something completely new every day. People flock from all over the world to see it. Though that's less of a feat now with the everywhere shows. Still, it's time after the day, and it shows... Aren't you worried it might, you know? Might what? Hurt someone? Kill someone? Oh, it might, if we were ever so disrespectful to lock it away and leave it unseen, letting it wallow in its own filth. <laughs> I always wondered, <laughs> it shits all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Any person would do the same. It's a statue, David. It's art. It stops when it's seen because it wants to be seen. And it told you this, I'm guessing. You mentioned talking to a to Phnom before. Everyone in the crowd like gasps. <laughs> <laughs> How did you accomplish that? Pact 5. We cobbled together a peculiar ham radio, the juices of a telepathic aclifloris plant, and hijacked this pan-global phenomic radio frequency after liberating several thousand abducted children from a Russian folk demon. Those were steps free of... Oh, I remember that article. <laughs> I know not getting the rest. <laughs> I remember that one. We read that, right? I think so, yeah. Yay. As for the statue, it's not much for talking. We figured it out the old-fashioned way. Trial, error, and patience. Oh, and trust that it couldn't just be a concrete killing machine. What was 6000's theme again? It was the future, I believe. Oh. I don't think I could ever have that kind of trust. Not when I've seen what that thing is capable of. Primrose smiled at me fondly and a tad condescendingly. I think I know where to take you next. The compendium recognizes the absent party. I warned them. They didn't listen. We can't redeem them. No. <laughs> Who's that supposed to be? I think be? that's nobody. <laughs> Lamau. 
Uh, I'm getting tired. Why did you give me the heavy reading roll? That's your job. Because I knew, well, you know, maybe just that suited for it. I'm, I'm a mature reader after all. Point zero, Australia. Primrose said point zero, Australia, and I suppose that's where we went. Just by looking, I couldn't have guessed. We were inside a glass dome, the kind with familiar half-meter-thick polymer glass I'd seen in a thousand containment cells. The dome was vast, but not massive, closer to a small airport terminal than anything. Outside, the world was lush and tropical, with trees stretching high above the dome and flowering vines growing off our glass shell. I'm hardly a botanist, but it was surreal not being able to identify a single plant. They were each of them wholly new, the trees with their bark layered like armored plates, flower bulbs hanging off thin fibers dropped down from rigid green stalks like a fishing pole in lure. It was also spectacular that I almost missed the 20-meter reptile standing in front of me. My lungs collapsed. I turned to run, instinctively tripping over my own two feet. I scrambled back with all the primal fear in my primate body as I stared into the eyes of a... Of the apex predator, the unkillable monster. Some part of me knew there was a wall of shatterproof glass between us. Another part knew it wouldn't be enough to stop that thing. It lumbered forwards, I recoiled. Then Primrose stepped calmly between us. She sat. It stopped. He's only visiting. The lizard held its place for a moment longer, its vast web of black bead eyes staring into me. Then it turned away. All eight of its legs thundered in the ground as it moved. Sweat streaked down my forehead. Primrose watched the creature vanish into the tree line, then turned to face me. Sorry about that, I just had to see it for myself. The killer instinct of the Immorticon is pure legend. Immo- Sweet Christ, you have a pet name for that thing? Pet name? That's his genius, genius. It's what we call all of them. In the clearings to the west, in the hills to the east, and weaving through the rainforest thick ahead, thicket ahead were dragons, hundreds of them, colossal lumbering bodies and shark-billed skeletal maws, so very much like the nightmare of my own world. Yet they all looked healthy. Their limbs were coated in pale patterned scales of blue, green, and yellow. Their bodies were covered in shaggy coats, each hair strand thick enough to be a braid, all long and hanging like willow tree wisps. That they... Yes, they are. Second deadliest animal on the planet. They were third until we got rid of, rid of mosquitoes. Humans. Oh, so mosquitoes aren't good enough. Fucking gotcha. Yeah, well, <laughs> they were irredeemable, we found. <laughs> Humans still get the top rank, of course. Fascinating creatures, the Immortigon. Immortal, of course, by any means other than themselves. They work a bit like lions mixed with lobsters. Once one gets big, old, and slow enough, the rest of the pack devours it. They were, a, well, it'd be disrespectful to call them a nuisance, but really, as long as we kept a, a war between our land and theirs, stayed out of their sights, they only really killed idiot trespassers and approaches. We knew they were intelligent, we tried to reach out, but they killed every messenger. Until what? What goddamn phenom- anom- food miracle did you pull po- po- people do to pull this off? Nothing. Nothing? Well, nothing overt, nothing direct. We must have done something, because one day they just stopped. During a routine scientific survey, one of our researchers crashed right down to a nest of Mortigon, and they grew by the dozen. Except they didn't kill him, he wore right out. We tried to send a rescue drone, but he just refused. Mad damn scientist he was, he walked through a whole field of those things during their meeting season. We all assumed that by the end of research at Clef, you can imagine our surprise when he shows up unscathed. Why, how? Like I said, we don't quite know the how. We did ask them why, though, and they replied. The first and only thing those creatures have ever said to us is, we're no longer disgusting. So that's nice, I guess. I stared out over... Does, is this something Clef did? I'm confused. <laughs> I think it's because they were no longer evil humans. <laughs> I stared out over the strange jungles of Australia. Primrose sat with me, and we remained there for a long while. I saw countless other creatures, some foreign to me, some terrifyingly familiar. Freakish raptor dogs ran in packs, barking at each other in arbitrary English phrases. A flock of airplane dwarfing birds soared overhead. The birds are going to eat the whole world! We're going to destroy them! Oh! No, actually, they're allowed to do that on the, Tuesday. <laughs> it, it, it gets rid of the mold on the world. It makes it nice yeah, again. Yeah, they, they poop the world back out. You didn't know? <laughs> A procession of humans walked by, one stressed in woven leaves and uh, carved bones. They were headed to the coast, holding a long eel skeleton above their heads like something out of a Chinese New Year's parade. A young girl waved to me. I waved back. No matter how hard I try, I can't recall her face. Are they like the fucking anti-memetic dinos? Oh, maybe. Are they like wearing their parts, perhaps? Oh, well, yeah, maybe. You've got a strange, beautiful little world here, Primrose. That's the cat calling the kettle black. Don't repeat that, by the way. It's a cat phrase. Only cats can use it. I broke out laughing. Primrose did too. She asked if I was hungry. I was, in the way only near death could inspire. We had a late lunch. The compendium recognized. Uh, is it... Hold on. That's the kettle calling the. 
how does it normally go? Or the, the kettle calling the pot black. The pot calling the kettle black. That's what it is. The compendium recognizes the workshop. I'm not much for all this fate of the world stuff. I'm only here because I drew the short straw. I keep my hand, head down and my hands busy and leave all this politic and policy stuff to you lots. You send in for now, we send our packs and we stay out of each other's business. That's the deal. So you want to know what we think of A6K? Fine. The wimps! Look, when you're working with Prometheus's fire, sometimes you get burned. Sometimes you create a black hole when you stuff an improving machine inside itself. Sometimes you create an army of cyborg super zombies. Sometimes you're misplaced the entire population of Massachusetts. That don't mean you stop trying. You clean up your damn mess and get back to work. The world doesn't get better otherwise. So, partnership's mostly right. A6K doesn't really have anything we don't, but the one research they have to offer us is innovators. Except all over there, all the real innovators are labeled as cooks, crab pots, and idiot savants. I say let them figure out how to build a better spine. Until then, we can't work with them. Workshop Union votes no. We suck. Damn. <laughs> Fucking hell, we're not good enough for these guys. <laughs> this is a very long article, by the way. This is going to be a part two bar, episode. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I propose we get to the end of this next little script, and then we, we go to the comment reading. Sure. Location, Herman Fuller's Museum of the Extraordinary, and others, Nashville, Tennessee. We stepped out of the plastic white clamshell UFO that Primrose had called a transport pod, eating pizza we'd picked up in Detroit. Apparently, they were the kings of the slice in this universe. Go figure. I could hardly believe it was all grown in the lab. The meat, the cheese, even the yeast. It was fantastic. I finished my last bite of crust, wiped my hands on my jeans, and gestured back at the pod. Why do you people still have those things? You can teleport. We still need to move couches, David. And asking a chair to help move a couch would be deeply insensitive. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. We walked through a racist. pavilion... <laughs> We walked through a pavilion wrapped around a magnificent three-story stone fountain. Its clear water trickled out, forming thousands of tiny rivers in the masonry grout. Rich green moss grew through like the lines of a circuit board. Around us, semicircular buildings rose up, tiered and staggered, so you could see each one simultaneously if you stood at the pavilion center. With the massive, rounded windows aiming in, I felt as though I was being watched by a crowd of giants. When Primrose suggested more museums, I'd been surprised. It was exactly what I'd wanted to do. I didn't complain, but I carried an uncomfortable feeling with me all afternoon. It was all too perfect. This reality was like walking through the home of a successful sibling, looking at all their great accomplishments and awards. It was a bitter, jealous feeling, condemning someone just for their success. As we walked through the marble halls of the Natural History Museum, I paused at a large avian skeleton bound upright on brass poles. It had a large pot belly, a stork-like neck, and a terribly sharp beak. I peered past the ribs, trying to discern the purpose of a strange mass of bones. They almost looked like the internals of a pocket watch. Primrose walked up beside me. So, this is what happens to the phenom that don't fit into your little utopia? This poor creature expired all on its own, David. When the phenom doesn't fit, we find somewhere that it does. And of reality, usually. So, you dump your problems on someone else. <laughs> He's trying to, like, find the, the cool thing to say. <laughs> He's yeah. like, I won't let you do this anymore! <laughs> Uh, you have to be evil. Will we die in the dark so you can live in the light? <laughs> Where's the dark? <laughs> Where's the dark? That's too bright. <laughs> Ma, I, you... thought th I thought it would be less bright than this. Ma, you really are dead set on painting us as the villains, aren't you? No, David, we find solutions. Some photophobic phenom finds himself far happier on worlds without light. Other more brutal creatures enjoy a harsher environment, less civilized places. If we can't make it work here, we match the reality to phenom and vice versa. Seems like a clean little system. Because I have onto your game. <laughs> Before Primrose could reply, I stalked off again. We made our way to the Museum of Technology, saying nothing. Primrose kept a cautious few steps behind me. I walked quickly past many exhibits I likely would have found fascinating, but I was set on something. I needed to find what was missing here. Deep in the basement of that museum, I found it. In that dimly lit room sat a large rusting apparatus, a mix halfway between a howitzer and a Tesla coil, stripped, gutted, but unmistakably an engine of war. It was one of many paradoxically antique space age weapons here, lining the walls and filling glass cabinets. I breathed out a dark, satisfied sigh. So, tell me, why would such a peaceful world need machines like these? Primrose sat at my heels, illustrating how a cat shows confusion. It was very in the ears. Is that what this has been about? Oh, David. Don't know David me out with it! Of course about war. I never claimed we didn't. It'd be mostly cold, but not entirely bloodless. No empire is never built without at least some corpses in its foundation. 
Primrose led me through the exhibit without hesitation or shame. About a century ago, the Wanderers confronted the Foundation directly. They'd found out about a, uh, well, what the Foundation considered necessary evil, and they considered an unforgivable sin. I'd simply call it a hellish tragedy what happened to that girl, but regardless, it brought those two great oh. powers to Viscous Arts. Was it, was it, uh, uh... I assume vicious odds, but that's fine. Uh, is this uh, Montauk, you I'm think? thinking probably, yeah. Some of the first alliances of the Compendium were forged in those days, purely from necessity. The Foundation banded with the Peacekeepers, and together they built the workshop atop a cursed factory. The Wanderers folded in the fringe groups, the Red Hands, and followers of the Serpent King. They built stockpiles of terrible and possible weapons on two sides of invisible, prun- invisible fronts. That's where Part 5 came from, actually. It was a weapon of war. You need to be able to talk to Phenom to give them orders. So what happened? Well, look around you, David. Do you think any of us would be here if that war had turned hot? No, eventually the stockpiles got so big and the weapons became so unimaginably monstrous that neither side could have actually envisioned using them. So they started talking, bit by bit. They started offering each other concessions and suggestions and new ways of tackling their sure problems. And then together they turned the weapons towards the shared enemies. Ancient, hateful immortals neither side could vanquish on their own. Together they set that girl free, from there they folded into many other groups dealing the transmundane, and well, the rest is history. I stared into one of the displays. It genuinely looked like a spray-painted Nerf gun. I chuckled weakly. If I had to make a deal with the devil, I would simply kill the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking countermeasure? <laughs> the counterweight or whatever? There, now are you done trying to flush the devil out of me? Alright, alright, I'm done. Good, and then they walk past the torture room. <laughs> He's like, please! <laughs> Help me! Oh, that's David. We despise him. <laughs> what was that? Oh, that's Mr. Opposite. He says he means he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we keep the last straight man, David. <laughs> By the way, uh, you're not. I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Primrose, I think it's your move. Good. Good. With that out of the way, can you please try to enjoy yourself? Sorry, I am enjoying myself, Primrose. Really, it's just hard not to be a bit skeptical, given all the things I've seen. I I realize I'm not the most fun person, so I really do appreciate all this. You really have picked the perfect places to lighten my mood, though. I love museums. I know. I glanced over at her. How exactly did you know that? Primrose flinched ever so slightly. You're a scientist, David. You're a nerd. (laughs) Of course you love museums. Before I could reply, Primrose walked off to another section. She was right. I was a scientist, I'd study, take notes, and theorize, and I was starting to develop a fairly good hypothesis about Primrose the cat. Why do I feel like there's a tension here? It's, like, <laughs> it's making me nervous. Why do I feel like he wants to do things with the cat? <laughs> Lord have mercy. All right, let's read this last compendium, and then maybe we can cap it off. We, yes. we might also be able to squeeze one more in up to you. Yeah, I think we should do this little compendium one. The compendium recognizes the apex, apex lessons. Over a century ago. Let's go. Over a century ago. Back in the compendium's infancy, four men met in an open field. They shook hands as equals, although three wore suits and one wore scat-stained overalls. The latter man's name was Wilson. When they asked him to help build a better world, he had only wrong requests. That request became Pact 15, and because of it, my 45th great nest mother was given the gift of higher thought. I perch here today because of that man and the willingness of the compendium to open itself up to new minds, new ideas, and new perspectives. So I'm guessing the apex is like apex, like animals that were given the ability to think and say, say well, things. Yeah. I shudder to imagine a world without such diversity of thoughts, a world of apes and apes alone. I mean, by the open sky, we wouldn't even be having this discussion about the works of the illustrious Dr. Primrose in her feline science reserve. We'd have no idea A6K exists. What we're seeing here through this tiny keyhole is what our world once was, a planet dominated by a single species and a single perspective. We cannot stand as hypocrites, my fellow Earthkind. We must reach out to them. The shared, oh, they use Earthkind here. The shared apex ascension vote, yes. So I, this is cute. I like the, the positivity of this article, even if it comes across to me slightly naive, but I really hope this ends in a really comical way where there's just utter violence that is completely unnecessary. I don't I know. Suppose we'll see next time. <laughs> I'm liking it so far, though. I really want to keep reading this. Good good work, T. Rutherford. I like it so far. I'll read it when we finish it. Uh, but for now, I suppose we have some comments to read, don't we? Yeah, let's see what this, the fucking trait is after to say. 
All right. Not a Swedish skinwalker says, late happy birthday, Tan. And you called him a traitor. <laughs> they, they, they say this to my face, but behind closed doors. They sharpen <laughs> behind the blades. Behind closed doors. <laughs> they die in the dark so I can let in the light. I Wait, used to live in the lights till they dragged me into the shadows. <laughs> now they call me Judas Honey. I lived in the light till they buried me beneath the earth. Under a carpet of their sins. <laughs> Fucking hell. Way too many passwords <laughs> the, 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 today, but I have never... in my mouth. <laughs> uh, not a sweet skinwalker says, way too many passwords today, but I've never drank coffee. And what Tan was going to say was data expunged. I don't have any SCP recommendations since 99% of my exposure to the Wiki is your videos. I'm Based. so sorry. Oh my god. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. It's like SCPs about anime, right? <laughs> um, about that. Chris Merkel Studio says, never ask a man his salary, a woman her weight, or a Pokemon trainer why Octillery is their favorite. Why? Happy 29th slash 23rd birthday. You, you were talking about the Pokemon leaks in oh, Octillery right, yeah. last. I wasn't familiar early. with the Octillery. <laughs> Happy 29th slash 23rd birthday, Tanhoney. I myself am turning 30 in November, and by that time I hope to have published the first couple chapters of my very first serialized story. <gasps> Competition. I'll let you know where they're up, assuming I can get to the comments early enough. Hell Yes! Speaking of which, this is literally the earliest I could get to the comments this week, so if I don't make the cutoff, I'll be convinced Darnell hates me. I could never hate you, Chris Merkel Studios. Isn't that nice? One of us can't hate you. Yeah, but Tan <laughs> he, He's like the am of people. Uh, Shaitalia says, I guess I'll just recommend the only SCP I recommended before, which was 6001, I believe, but it's kind of long, so it's up to you. It is up to me, and I made that choice. I used what little rights remain to me to make that choice. <laughs> Interesting. When I was a kid, anime wasn't really something to be embarrassed about here in the Philippines. It was just this cool new thing to enjoy with your friends. I think I remember seeing a jeepney with Naruto painted on it, even. That's a better world than us. This is That's their 6001. <laughs> what was it? What, that, that Naruto <laughs> painted? Why is anyone burning that place down? Uh, we don't do such things here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but don't people call them a weep? Ooh, you can't say that word, David. That person's wearing an anime shirt. Why haven't they been murdered? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Sackheim says, not sure if it's too late to comment, but whatever. Don't want you guys to feel obligated to read SCP articles. I still find you two entertaining regrets. You alone. The last true you fan. Alone. <laughs> you alone are the honored one. For an SCP recommendation, I choose SCP-5040. It's short and sweet, but warning! It contains explicit gore torture. <laughs> Yummy! <laughs> Sorry, uh, MT I, says, went, I went harder than I expected to on that. <laughs> MT I'm pretty sure this is like the loudest I've ever been in an episode. I didn't even hear it. It like peaked the mic. I, 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 I rubbed my hands and went, yummy! <laughs> <laughs> MT2K1 says, congratulations, Anthony. You're old. For a present, <laughs> since you were so sad that you, you haven't gotten any D threats, here you go. It's a hand and a little present. There's an Amori manga. Apparently I haven't read it. Uh, because I don't want to be sad. For an interesting SCP reading, try 6634. It's an interactive point-and-click game. Also, 7838 is an interesting SCP connected to the Hanged King. It's got a Cthulhu Mythos feel to it. Damn. There's an Amori manga? Um, apparently. I, I know, it's I mean, like, it used to be a series of images that eventually became a comic. I found that out by myself. Yeah. We're true Amori heads. You yeah. wouldn't get it. Smokes. We were there from, like, day 30. Not day one, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me... Da, 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 da. Uh, I think that's everything, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. Hey, how are you feeling? Did you like returning to your old world? I did, yeah. So will you forgive the fans for their, um, transgressions? I will. <gasps> Character Arconi! Everybody, say thank you, Tanhoney. Much like Christ, a big hug. I'll forgive you. <laughs> Much like Christ? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy work. Holy shit. <laughs> I love the idea of getting in an argument with someone. You're like, it's okay, I forgive you. I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the most condescending thing imaginable. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you like this, you should check out Aetheral Space. It's not at all similar, but um, it's fun. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.